Good morning, everyone. I would like to welcome you to this public accounts meeting. I call this meeting to order. Today we have with us the Department of Finance and the Department of Health and Wellness. Um, we will start with introductions, beginning with Mr. McGuire. Good morning, everyone. Brendan McGuire, Halifax Atlantic. Good morning. MLA Suzanne Lonis Croft, Lunenburg. Good morning, Chuck Porter, Hans West. Joachim Stroink, Halifax Shabakdo. Ian Rankin, Timberley Prospect. Good morning, welcome. My name is Tim Houston. I'm the MLA for Picto East. Good morning, Dave Wilson, MLA for Sackville Cobbequid. My name is Alan McMaster, MLA for Inverness, and your chair. We have also with us the uh, Auditor General's office. We'll have Mr. Spicer um, begin with his introduction. Terry Spicer, Deputy Auditor General. And Tammy Squires. Actually, your mic is on. And Tammy Squires. Thank you, Ms. Squires. Uh, we'll start with introductions uh, of our guests, beginning with Ms. Kumaranayaki. Uh, Lilani Kumaranayaki, Executive Director, of Fiscal Planning, Economics and Budgetary Planning in the Department of Finance and Treasury Board. Robert Bourgeois, Director of Financial Accounting in uh, Finance and Treasury Board. Byron Rafuse, Deputy Minister of Finance, uh, Department of Finance and Treasury Board. Good morning, Denise Perret, Deputy Minister, Health and Wellness. Good morning, David Bartol, Senior Executive Director, Corporate Services and Asset Management, Department of Health and Wellness. Good morning, Dr. Robert Strang, Chief Medical Officer of Health of the Department of Health and Wellness. Good morning, Tim Guest, Vice President, Integrated Health Services and Chief Nursing Officer for the Nova Scotia Health Authority. And Christine Gibbons, Executive Director of Corporate Process and Quality with Health and Wellness. Thank you, everyone. A reminder to ensure your phones are on silent. Today's topic is healthcare funding and the Auditor General's uh, follow-up on Auditor General recommendations from uh, 2013 and 2014 Auditor General reports. Um, we will allow some time for opening comments from both uh, uh, finance and health and wellness. Perhaps we'll begin with health and wellness uh, and Ms. Pratt. Thank you. Um, as noted, the subject is healthcare funding with a focus on federal transfers and, uh, and the Auditor General report from 2013-2014, those recommendations. Um, there's two parts to federal funding. There's the Canada Health Transfer, which is focused on having provinces and territories adhere to the principles of the Canada Health Act. And it tends to be, uh, it, it's a per capita funding that doesn't have strings tied to it except for those principles under the Act. And new funding that uh, has been announced by the federal government is Accord funding, uh, which is focused on what the feds would say is health system transformation. And uh, so they put in additional money uh, specifically as they state to improve health outcomes for Canadians as one of their goals and to address gaps in the healthcare system. And their focus has been in, in the discussions that we've had and in their, and their discussions in the media on home care. So they are reinforcing that shift we see across the country from acute to community and on mental health funding with a special emphasis on providing filling gaps and services for those under 25 years of age. So just as provinces and territories have recognized the need for a shift in health in the way health care systems are structured uh, and how we provide services, the federal government has also expressed its commitment to affect change. And there's a research binder that's put together for, for members of this committee. It was particularly well done, I thought, uh, for this session. And one of the items in it is David Naylor's report on innovation in health care. And, and, and it's an important report. It's one that shouldn't be on a shelf. It should be in front of everyone. Because Dr. Naylor, very, in a very straightforward manner, um, sets out what some of the issues are in our healthcare system and the opportunities and challenges before us. Uh, it, it, it's a very instructional document and a good background for uh, what I, the discussion that I'm anticipating here this morning. Um, he notes, uh, and we've discussed this before, that access to primary care in this country uh, has been an ongoing, ongoing concern for over two decades. And he observes, his words, are that Medicare in Canada is badly aging. And so we've had this discussion, and I have to say that in the Nova Scotia context, because all provinces and territories are faced with these challenges and opportunities, the one thing that stands out for me is that we're seeing a tremendous response 
uh, from outside of government circles, from front care health workers. Uh, Doctors Nova Scotia issued a report uh, that went public today. Uh, I've met with pharmacists, uh, paramedics we've discussed in this chamber. There are a number of people that step up to the challenge. And as I learn more about the story in this province, it's very much like the 90s. In the 90s, we had significant fiscal challenges in health, and we saw dramatic responses. The closure of hospital beds, uh, we saw many of the same issues that we're dealing with today with ED departments that were closing and the like. And what came out of that is a tremendous innovation, particularly in community paramedicine, which as we've discussed, is, is leads the world in many respects. Um, so we had the pleasure of hosting the, health, the federal health minister in late January. Um, she toured the EHS uh, Community Communication Centre, very interested to hear about the response of the paramedic community to providing services to seniors in the community uh, and, and how that could be scaled and spread in Nova Scotia and across the country. She received a presentation from pharmacists on the Bloom program, uh, which is a program that provides in-depth medication management uh, to those uh, suffering from mental illness. And also importantly, uh, the pharmacists provide important navigational services for patients and link with other healthcare providers in a collaborative fashion. And there's about 221 patients enrolled in that program. Uh, and she learned a bit about uh, our Strongest Families Institute and how we have online services through phone and internet, uh, providing mental health services to children, youth, and families. And so her response to that uh, was that she was impressed, and that was in line with what the federal government is thinking it wants to support as we move forward. In regard to the recommendations from the Office, office of the Auditor General, uh, I think we can report that good progress is being made uh, by the Department of Health and Wellness and by the Nova Scotia Health Authority. In particular, we're pleased with the progress in public health. Um, recently, there have been announcements that we've adopted the Panorama uh, IT solution. So that is going to provide us with an immunization and vaccine inventory we predict by fall of 2017. Uh, and it increases our ability to track and report on notifiable diseases and increase our surveillance capacity. And this is really important because the more we know about population health needs, the more we can respond on a community level and organize collaborative care, primary care to meet the needs of specific communities. We know that there's been also a lot of work done in meeting the recommendations on alternative funding payments to physicians. Where there is still work to be done is on wait times. Uh, and I note that there's been both a significant investment on this front. We had an additional $4.2 million in 2014-15, another $2 million in 2015-16, and $8.1 million in 16-17. And what we've seen in the most recent report is that Nova Scotia, and I think it was the only province, showed significant improvement on all fronts. That doesn't mean that it's reached the levels that it needs to reach, but the investments seem to be moving us in the right direction. Uh, there's always more work to do, and I'm very appreciative that Tim Guest from the Health Authority is here to address questions you may have on that front. Um, so I'll close there uh, and look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Perrett. Mr. Rafus, would you like to offer some comments? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good morning uh, to the committee. I'd like to make some brief opening remarks on health care funding and the follow-up to the Auditor General's 2013 and 14 recommendations. Uh, Nova Scotia is one of nine provinces and three territories that have agreed in principle to a new ha health care funding. As with other federal funding, the formalization of this will be done through federal legislation. Originally we had called this an agreement, but now that it's being implemented, it will now be implemented through legislation uh, because more provinces are on board. The, health, the Canada Health Transfer is an un unconditional transfer uh, designed to assist provinces and territories with health care funding, as the Deputy of Health has indicated. To receive the transfer, uh, the province must agree to the five principles of the Canada Health Act. Universality, accessibility, portability, comprehensiveness, and public administration. Starting in 2014 and 15, the Canada Health Transfer was modified to distribute a national pool of cash on an equal per capita basis based on the jurisdiction's share of the national population. At that time, 
the CHT was extended in federal legislation for 10 years and the end year being 2023-2024. Beginning in 19, uh, sorry, in 2017-18, the escalator and then the CHT became the three-year average growth of the national nominal GDP with a floor of 3%. The floor will be in effect for the 2017-18 fiscal year. For 2017-18, the national pool of cash is $37.1 billion. Nova Scotia is estimated to receive $967.2 million based on having 2.6% of the national population. In addition to the Canada Health Transfer, the federal government has offered the provinces and territories $11 billion per capita of targeted funding for home care, and that's $5 billion across uh, the next 10 years, for mental health, that's $5 billion across the next 10 years, and for home and community health care infrastructure, and that's an additional $1 billion over the next four years. The province is, uh, is currently in the process of finalizing the details uh, regarding the reporting under this target, targeted funding. Revenue for the targeted funding initiatives will be commenced in 2017 and 18. Further details of this will be provided in the province's budget of 2018, which will be tabled on April the 27th. Nova Scotia receives about one-third of its overall revenue and transfers from the federal government. The Canada Health Transfer is the second largest of these transfers. In 1617, that amounted to $944 million. I should note that health care spending is government's biggest expense and is at currently $4.3 billion. The rising cost of health care is a challenge for every jurisdiction in Canada uh, at the present time. We have made strong efforts in Nova Scotia to slow the budgetary growth in this sector using innovation and technology to deliver health care joint purchasing, shared services, and reducing the administrative costs uh, uh, within the province. I believe my colleague at the Department of Health would agree that uh, the partnership we have with the federal government is very important uh, for the health uh, and, and wellness uh, and the services we provide to the to citizens of Nova Scotia. In relation to the Auditor General's reports of 2013 and 2014, I'm pleased to report that the Department of Finance and Treasury Board has completed 18 of the 25 recommendations. Furthermore, we have plans to complete five more uh, of the remaining seven uh, this year. Of the remaining two, we have partially completed those re requirements and continue to work on full implementation. To highlight the work the Department of Finance has completed, we have updated procedures and process to support the government's financial statements and communications with stakeholders. These, include, these processes include uh, updating processes and, and procedures, supporting major line items in our consolidated financial statements, within our revenue estimate process, and the thresholds related to tax changes. We also have ensured amounts in the general revenue fund and the consolidated uh, financial statements are supported and, and are in, reported in, in, in accordance with the public sector accounting standards. And we have improved communications between ourselves and government agencies to ensure that timely completion of responses uh, or, or issues and, uh, and deficiencies that are identified in their statements are, uh, and by their auditors are dealt with in a timely manner. I thank you uh, uh, for the time, uh, the opportunity for the opening remarks, and I look forward to the committee's questions. Thank you, Mr. Rafius. We'll begin with Mr. Houston of the PC Caucus for 20 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the opening comments. Um, Deputy Rafuse, can you would you mind just can we get a copy of your opening comments? There's a lot of numbers in there, which I appreciate. If we could get a copy of that, that'd be great. If I could, if could I uh, wait till I get you a clean copy? I have a lot of notes sitting up, but I, uh, no problem. I wouldn't mind your notes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just was trying to capture. So in terms of the so the premier announced uh, a deal with the federal government two days before Christmas. It was a deal and agreements. I think you, you referred to it, no, it's, we're not calling an agreement anymore because it's going to end up in legislation. It's, it's probably still, they agreed to something. Is it, and, it's, and it's kind of, there's a lot of moving parts probably to what I assume to what was agreed. Most of those moving parts are, are unclear to me. Uh, I've watched some of the minister's press clippings and it seems like maybe there might be unclear to him as well. But I'm wondering how unclear they actually are. So, do you have anything you can you can provide to this committee that says 
this is what we agreed to two days before Christmas in terms of the, the funding that will come each year and what the stipulations might be around that. Could you table something for this committee that would, would show what the agreement was? Mr. Rafuse? I actually, had, if when I give you copies of my opening remarks, that actually does outline of it. And I said, we originally called this an agreement because at the time, as you, as you realize, um, there was bilateral conversations going on uh, because the discussions at the national table were, were not successful. At that time, at, uh, in December, there were uh, actually uh, three provinces that had agreed uh, um, to uh, uh, the additional funding for health care. And at that time, since there was only three provinces, our discussions with the federal government was, well, we need to have this wrapped up in, a, in some type of an agreement. Um, and as we worked through that, uh, it was quite clear to us that the federal government were actually having conversations with other jurisdictions because that kind of conversation kind of slowed down for them. So we stopped talking about an agreement. And it wasn't until we actually uh, got confirmation when the federal government uh, tabled its budget that it did, like, uh, it did enable uh, the transfers of, of this additional money, uh, which is on t outside of the CHST, uh, to be uh, enabled the federal government, which is, is which in, in fact, the more typical way in which government uh, federal transfers do occur to provinces, there usually isn't an agreement per se. There's an understanding, and then it's embedded in legislation. So right. those things that I did talk about earlier, that there are, because uh, uh, the principles of the CHST remain, but there are targeted funding uh, for home care, mental health, and infrastructure in those areas. So I want to talk about that. So. Um, who First off, just so I understand, who, who negotiates the agreement? Is it, was it the Department of Finance or Department of Health? Or who, who actually represents Nova Scotia in those negotiations? At the, um, at the, at the federal, provincial, uh, territorial uh, finance meetings in December, uh, the ministers of health were uh, asked uh, to join that meeting. And likewise, at the ministers of health uh, uh, FTB meeting, I believe it was in October, the, the, the ministers of finance joined that meeting. So it's been a joint effort uh, uh, of both uh, departments along with uh, uh, the, uh, the premier's office, office and all jurisdictions and the federal government. So in terms of what in terms of what, thank you. So, in terms of what came out of, so what the what the deal is, um, the deal was signed very quickly. I mean, it's obviously, and and who knows, maybe we can find out why that was, why we jumped. I do have some questions about how that deal improves healthcare in Nova Scotia, because that's that's not certainly not clear to me at all. But going into those going into those discussions, and certainly a lot of media reports have suggested that the transfer the transfer rate that was agreed to is not what, what's needed to maintain the level of services in this province. So in other words, there, there was a lot of discussion. I've seen the number 5.2, which is a very precise number, that we would have needed uh, federal transfers to escalate at 5.2% at a year to maintain the level of services that we have. That's not the deal that was reached. So I'm wondering, is, is, do you, are you familiar with that 5.2 number? Yes. Is, it, is, is there any validity to that number, that that's, that's a number that would have, made, would have made the finances of this province uh, around healthcare work more efficiently and effectively? Is there any validity to that number? Is it a number that came from your department? Or? Um, leading up to this conversation, there was a lot of work done at the official level uh, to talk about what the healthcare spending and growth um, has been in, across the country. Uh, there was a, 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 a this work was done by all provinces and territories. It, it looked at the historical uh, trend pattern of healthcare spending and also the federal government's participation rate uh, in provincial healthcare spending. At one time. Uh, that rate was at the f at approximately the 50% level with the federal government. That has dropped down uh, to uh, levels, depending on what province you're in, it, you know, you're in the, as I say, the 20 to, to the low 20% uh, rate. Um, those percentages came out of uh, thinking out of those groups where if you look at perhaps uh, uh, historical spending patterns, that was where there was a, a rate of around 6% was, uh, was, uh, was, uh, uh, was uh, developed. The 5.2, I believe, was a rate which would bring the federal government's participation up to the 25% level. Uh, as, as, as that being the appropriate target for federal participation and, and provincial health care expenditures. Um, the, the difficulty, or, the, or it's not the difficulty. Is that, is that relevant to, to Nova Scotia? 5.2 would have brought us up to 25%. 
I'm There's, not sure that was a national average. I'd have to get the precise amount okay, for Nova okay, Scotia. Okay, do we have? Yeah, the, it'd be interesting to have the precise number. For If 25% is kind of what people accept is what the Fed should be paying, are we at 25%? No, we're not at And, and Clifton, that's, that is a, <clears throat> as a, a guiding point. There's no uh, 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 requirement for the federal government to be at 25 In fact, there was no requirement for the federal government to change anything. They had a, an agreement on health care funding that reaches out and legislation in place that goes to 20, 20, 24, 25. Uh, so there was no obligation to the federal government to do anything. This was a NAS from the provinces. They were looking for amounts <coughs> because uh, the, the Canada Health Act had previously had escalator clauses at around 6%. <coughs> That, ch that was changed back uh, as I ended. It was a whole, there was a whole, it was a huge issue in, a f in an entire federal election. Yeah. So I, I don't want to debate what the federal government uh, is obligated to do or shouldn't or shouldn't do, but they certainly made some promises to get themselves elected and then now changed. I'm more interested in how the impact of that change on, on Nova Scotians. So they're not at, they're, it would have taken, I guess, what, I guess what I'm hearing is 5.2 was a kind of a, na a, a number that's relevant nationally and the relevance of the number is that it would bring the federal um, contribution to the cost of health care in provinces up to 25 percent. Mm. We're going to get the number for Nova Scotia but but it, it sounds like the provinces I guess universally accepted that 25 percent is what we should strive for as the federal contribution. Would that be fair to say that that was the, the provinces including Nova Scotia's position that the feds should be paying about 25 percent? Would you would it be fair to say that's that, that should be the Nova Scotia position. You should be paying 25%. That was the position that was presented to the table as a negotiating Okay, position. so that was our starting point. And our ending point was quite a bit lower, even though we were the first, amongst the first people to stand up on the chair and say, well, isn't this wonderful? We got a deal, but we didn't get a deal that's helpful hmm. to the province is what I'm, is what I'm wondering. So um, this year, the federal transfers under the, under the Canadian health transfers I think you said 967 million, and then an additional amount under the targeted funding. What's the additional amount for this year under the targeted funding? The additional amounts for the targeted funding will be included in our budget, which will be tabled in, uh, on April the 27th. Okay, so you're not able to say what that what that amount is. No, I, I really, it's convention would be I would not release an amount that's not. It's not okay. okay. Okay, but the 967, that's, that's, you can say that because that's some old formula, is it? Or? That's, uh, not only is that, that's actually on the federal government's website. They, we, they, they give us that information on CHT funding in December where they actually project what it is based on the formula for the upcoming year and they revise the amount for the current year we're in based on uh, an updated figure of our population. Okay, and that, presumably they'll put the targeted funding number online too when, when they're ready, I guess? Uh, I think they would be, uh, but that would be up to the federal government. Okay. The, um, the timing of the, of the, of the can you, is there anything you could point your finger to that says, well, that, that, was, that was so compelling what they offered two days before Christmas that we just had to sign it right at that moment? Well, is there anything you can kind of succinctly say is this is the reason we jumped at this so, so quick? Uh, because a lot of people would say that, that the fact that the, 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 our, our maritime provinces, the Atlantic provinces jumped pretty quick, that obviously gave some momentum to the federal government that I personally would say hurt all Canadians in their negotiations with this, but that's my personal opinion. But what can you point to that says we had to sign this right then and there, I don't know, other than... I think that'd be a better question best asked uh, uh, to the ministers and the, pr and the premiers who make the decision on whether or not to accept that deal. I can tell you that at the federal provincial meetings in December, uh, when there was an agreement on the funding, the federal government actually pulled all, thing, all funding off the table and there was nothing on the table at that point for targeted funding. Uh, and and uh, so the reason uh, to accept that deal is one in which you, need, you should really uh, speak to those individuals. I would just advise them about what the implications would be on a fiscal perspective. Okay. Were you surprised when you, did you hear it in the news the same time I did that, that a deal had been reached? I was part of the conversation. Okay. So, so were, were you, how would you characterize your, your feeling when you heard that the minister said I signed it? Um, I advised okay. them on the financial implications of what the, of what the deal was and what the dollars would mean based okay. on our understanding of the agreement. Okay. We, we, the, province, the province signed uh, the province signed the deal, odd timing, just before Christmas, obviously. 
also odd timing because we, we signed it when we were probably recruiting a new deputy minister of, of health. I, I'd like to ask the deputy minister, did, were you aware of these as you, uh, you started the job on a certain day, you probably were offered the job sometime before that. Uh, was this deal signed after you were offered the job? If you can remember the timeline. Ms. Parrott. So I was uh, officially offered the job on November, at the very end of November. So it was signed after I was offered the job. Okay. But I had not started. I didn't commence until January okay. 16th. Were you, do, you, do you recall, were you consulted or kept informed during the month of December that this was happening and they're probably going to sign a new deal? Did you, were you, what was there? Because I know when you get offered a job, you, you're not really on the payroll, but you kind of start <laughs> simulating yourself into the culture and getting up to speed. Were you consulted at all on what might no, be signed? No, I, I was working in my, sorry, I was working in my uh, former job until the end of the first week in January, so my uh, loyalties were there, and I removed myself from all federal provincial matters. Okay. Um, in Deputy Ray Fuse, in your opening re remarks, you referred to um, the funding as unconditional at one point, but you also referred to the five principles that must be respected. So it's my understanding that if, if, if one of those principles is not respected in some way, um, it can jeopardize all of the funding. There is some risk around the funding, right? You have to, you have to respect the principles, otherwise the funding can, is at risk. Is that fair? Mr. Rafuse? Uh, that would be my understanding, but those principles were pretty broad, yes. No. Yeah, okay, so, um, but I'm just wondering about the types of things that could put the funding at risk. The, the, the Nova Scotia Health Authority is going through an accreditation process right now. Maybe the Deputy Minister of Health can tell us that the accreditation for the health authority is, I read that it was the spring of 2017. Is it, are we, has the accreditation process started? Ms. Ms. Parrott, sorry. Yes, sorry. Can I check with Mr. Guest on the uh, <clears throat> specifics? Mr. Guest, we have uh, started our, our preparation for the accreditation process, and our visit is in October of 2017. Okay. So there's reports in the media every day now, and, and even the Deputy of the Minister referred to some of the reports that have come out from doctors, from the NSGEU. I'm thinking of issues like the code census and issues around the delivery of healthcare that people are so rightly so concerned about right now. Is that the type of thing that can impact the accreditation process? Mr. Guest? N not directly. Uh, how we uh, plan for and respond to uh, those issues would be more relevant in that process. <clears throat> okay. Um, I do want to talk about um, the delivery of certain services in certain areas of the province and not in others. And I, I'm thinking about that in the context of the universality of the delivery of health care. So um, uh, we, we are supposed to have universal access to health care services to every citizen in every province in this country, that's one, of the, that's one of the principles. But when I look at um, some of the services that are, are delivered, particularly in rural areas, I'm gonna talk about um, um, palliative care. There's an, uh, Richmond was an example. Somebody s said to me this week that in Richmond County, uh, you can't get access to palliative care services after 4 p.m. each day. And, and then when I, when I dug in, somebody said, well, actually the health department's palliative care framework um, explicitly states that the people cannot be expected to provide this type of care everywhere in the province. I don't know how familiar you are with palliative care, the palliative care framework deputy, but I'm wondering about, are these the types of things we should be, we should be concerned about in terms of the transfer money? Ms. Parrott? So I wouldn't link it directly to the transfer money, so I wouldn't make it direct, a direct link. I can comment that one of the things that the federal government um, has promoted very strongly is that it wants record funding, uh, it sees it as an incentive to improve the provision of palliative care in the province. Mm -hmm. It feels quite strongly about that, I think, in the context of medical assistance in dying as well, that it sees a need to have uh, a provision of full services there 
and it is seen that as a gap across the country. So it is trying to provide incentives and direction on addressing those gaps. Okay, so you don't have any concerns about the universality universality of healthcare delivery in this in this province. Do you, is there any areas where you're concerned about that maybe we're not meeting that criteria? So I didn't say I didn't have concerns. When we talk about universality, it's certainly if we talk about it in terms of transfers, that only applies to funding for hospital and physician care. So the terms of the Canada Health Act on universality is just that Canadians mm -hmm. get hospital care and physician care in the insured services context paid for by public funds. That's what universality means. So I was answering in that context, and I believe we do that in Nova Scotia. The federal government has no concerns with our payment for those services here. Okay, so we have a number of areas in this province right now where people don't have a doctor. We have a number of areas in this province where people might, might call around to, to a neighboring community, to a, to a physician's office, and they're asked, um, where do you live? And they're often told, you don't live in our geographic area, we can't take you on as a patient. That's an issue for me. That's an issue around access to primary health care. And, and, I'm, and I'm hearing about patients being dismissed. We have that in our community, being dismissed from a, from a collaborative care clinic. So is that, where are we at? In, where are we at in health care in this province when, when you, you call up to try and get a doctor's appointment and they ask you where you live and then say, no, I can't, I can't help you because you live in that area and not this area. Where are we at in health care in this province when you, you, you call a doctor's office and the first person that answers the phone asks you, well, why is it that you want to see the doctor because, well, no, you can't see the doctor for that because that's what's happening. Because it takes so long to get patients, they need gatekeepers to figure out. That doesn't seem like um, like universal access to health care. Does it seem like it to you? So I agree that that's where Nova Scotia, other provinces are focused on how to improve that access. And as we've discussed, part of the improvement to access is to increase the number of providers that are able to support each other and to back each other up. Because if we're just gonna focus on access through a physician, uh, we have quite a narrow gate there. If we look at all our 40,000 healthcare providers and use them to their full mm -hmm. scopes in collaborative teams, we increase the access points. So as we've discussed, that's the focus of what we are, the, part of the shift, part of the change we're trying to affect in this province. Your question, your question has a number of angles on it, and, and I would agree with you. Some of the responses that you just indicated that people receive would concern me. But as we are restructuring the system, and I was very pleased to see Doctors Nova Scotia with its report because I think that opens up an important discussion. But partly we're talking about to what degree do physicians have autonomy as to where they locate, who they see, when they work, and to what extent, and, and we feel increasing public pressure, uh, does the so, province come in and try to manage that and plan for that? So there's a shift there. Yeah, and the shift is fine and the vision's fine and all those things, a doctor for every Nova Scotian, well, maybe not this year, maybe in three years and stuff, but, but I, I guess that, that's, all, that's all fine. I don't know, I don't, I, don't, I don't have a lot of faith in the execution on that, but I would I just ask a simple question. If where we're at now in the last two years and three years and four years, there hasn't been universal access to healthcare in this province, has there? In terms of what the federal government considers universal access, there is. Order. Time has expired. We'll move to the NDP. Mr. Wilson for 20 minutes. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Chair, and thank you uh, for being here. And, and actually, gonna, I'll keep on uh, the theme that my colleague has uh, has just brought up, and that's that's uh, uh, around physicians and their ability to uh, provide care to uh, to Nova Scotians. Uh, are you aware of the of the uh, of the uh, Supreme Court ruling in BC when the Br British Columbia government tried to? Uh, I would say dictate to physicians in that province where they could practice and uh, and the Supreme Court ruling had indicated uh, that the province is limited on doing that and and they couldn't do that are are you familiar with uh, with that ruling and uh, are you concerned uh, with the approach that the current government and the health authority has taken uh, could potentially put us at risk of physicians in this province uh, taking the same path that physicians in British Columbia took uh, to try to tell the government of the day 
uh, you can't restrict uh, access to primary care, access to family doctors because of where you live in the province. So I'm not, uh, I'm not intimately familiar with the BC case. I think that there have been a number of initiatives by different provinces looking at how to plan for services to improve access for services. And as I said, because traditionally we have private providers in primary care on the physician community uh, who have a, a great deal of autonomy in where they locate and how they go. So it needs to be a collaborative effort to have that planning process. I think that, um, that some of the restrictions, you'll look, I mean, the other province that actually does it more proactively and within the bounds of the Constitution is Quebec. Um, so there are ways of planning the system to focus on patients, to focus on communities and what they need, because that's at the heart of everything. And I think we have general agreement with the professions and, and the health authority and the department that that's where we start. Uh, and then we'll have those discussions and sort things out. So, so you've, you've mentioned that there are, there are restrictions. Would you agree that, that the current government, the system itself, the health authority, uh, are placing restrictions on physicians on where they can practice and who they can see uh, in the province? So there are no restrictions on a physician being licensed in the province. So, okay, so that, and that's, uh, that's the interesting part of it because you know, I understand uh, Dr. Harrigan uh, indicated to phys physicians that you are able to practice anywhere in the province. But the, the kicker to it is that uh, privilege, and, uh, privilege and approved uh, and approval or have approval to, to um, order tests will be, that's what's restricted. So it's great that, that you can have a license to practice anywhere in the province. You just hope that your patients that, you don't, that you're seeing don't need tests to be ordered. So is that correct? That yes, they can practice anywhere, but they won't be given access to order tests at the local hospital or or a clinic in the area that would do the testing needed to try to determine what is actually wrong with a patient if they if they're seen at a physician's uh, office. So my understanding is that, and as a new, relatively new initiative, the health authority is looking at credentialing as. A, one tool in negotiations with physicians as to how we service individuals and communities. So the starting point is, where, what are the needs of communities? Where are our primary care assets? And how do we plan uh, to serve those communities and individuals better? And that sometimes is a negotiation uh, and, and possibly uh, a bit of a tension between autonomy and the service to the community where I think we come together, where I think there is, where you can bring the discussion around to, uh, to agreement, is that increasingly we know we need to focus on health needs of communities, and we need to talk about these issues with the patient at the center. And then we'll talk about how we serve the patient and accommodate provider interests. So one of the things we're doing in response to balancing uh, physician autonomy and gaps in primary care service is building these teams. So we're putting in linkages, and, and by saying linkages, I don't want to underestimate the value of these services. We have nurse practitioners, and we've talked about it in this forum, and the Naylor report in your page seven, I believe, in your package, says since the 70s, we know that nurse practitioners, practitioners can do 70% of what a general practitioner can do effectively without affecting negatively health outcomes or expectations. So to fill the gaps, in the first order of business isn't to restrict where physicians are going, it's to put in new resources such as nurse practitioners, family practice nurses, and then we'll start to connect things. And we'll so so why, why, would we, why would we jump ahead of uh, having that in place by restricting ability for physicians to, to open up a practice? And, and I know it's been very frustrating and it, and it kind of is counter to what the Premier's commitment to Nova Scotians has been since he tried to seek office in, you know, four years ago, and that's a doctor for every Nova Scotian. So we, we talk about a collaborative approach, which I agree with, uh, we understand, but ultimately uh, Nova Scotians need access to, to, to family doctors. Is this an exercise to get around 
uh, the legal uh, requirement of a province to make sure that they don't infringe on the charter, uh, the rights of, of physicians. It, to me, that's what it, it sounds like. And I was very frustrated when Dr. Harrigan was here when I said that there are restrictions in place and she was indicating there wasn't. And we know the example of Way the community of Weymouth, for example. Um, so is this just an exercise to make sure that you're not, the government won't find itself in court in a few years? or in a few months or whenever that happens. I know it's a long process, so most likely a few years. Is, is that what's behind some of uh, the changes and the language of, of n you know, not saying we're not giving a license to a physician to practice in the province, but not offering privileges really handcuffs their ability to provide primary care? Is that, I see it as an exercise uh, in trying to circumvent ending up in court. Is, would you agree or not agree with that? I would not agree. Okay, we'll have to, I guess, disagree with that, and we'll, we'll have to, uh, to uh, kind of see where this all goes in the, into the future. Um, how is, um, when it comes to the budget, how are, how do we, uh, and I, I should remember this, but it's been a few years, how, how do we allocate the funding for, uh, for physicians? So a physician is licensed, they have a practice, they bill the province. Is it, is it done quarterly? Uh, so I know at the, when the budget's presented, there's, a, there's an overall estimate of, of what physician services will cost and, and, and we try to figure out what the upcoming year will be. So is that, how is the money allocated? Is it, is it allocated quarterly uh, or is the full sum put aside and, and, uh, and it's ready to be used? So my understanding, and if I'm incorrect, I will correct it later, uh, but there is, a, there is a budget approved for physician services and physicians provide those services and bill us through our medical services program and, and those billings are paid in the normal course. All right, so it's not, money's not allocated from finance on a quarterly basis, maybe the Deputy uh, Minister of Mr. Finance. Mr. As with all departments' budgets, uh, there's an annual appropriation of which uh, uh, is, is goes through this legislative process, and uh, within the Department of Health would be an amount allocated physician, and it is an, all an annual amount. They would, I would think, allocate it uh, out monthly for internal reporting purposes, uh, and, uh, but the actual budget is, is provided on an annual basis. And it's uh, and it's interesting to know. I mean, we know when we talk about physicians for every Nova Scotian, we and and the people that don't have physicians, we hear the ratio of per capita, which is is somewhat uh, you can interpret that in many different ways. But we're I believe we're the second lowest in the country when it comes to uh, funding to uh, to physician services. So currently we have in Central Region, I believe, 30 uh, vacancies, uh, 58 across the province from the r most recent uh, information that I have as of January. I believe there's 30 in Central, uh, 7 in Eastern, 7 in Northern, 14 in Western. Is, is there a savings to the province if those positions stay vacant? Uh, I know, because I was there, that when a vacant position is, is in the department, that, that's a bonus at the end of the year. It gives you wiggle room to, uh, uh, to spend that money. And, and we've seen in the last month, my Lord, uh, uh, you know, 70, 80 million dollars of spending from the, from the Premier. Uh, it, so is there a savings from those 58 positions? And that's just primary care. That's just family doctors. I'm not talking about um, specialists. So is there a savings to the province for those 58 positions the longer they go uh, vacant? Ms. Parrott? So I really appreciate you asking that question because if there's a perception of that out there, I would like to uh, set the record straight that there is absolutely no focus on saving money by not advancing it. In fact, uh, I think what we would find out, and, and if Mr. Guest has some more information, he can add to it, but there's actually an investment going into the effort to recruit physicians. If anything, we are uh, organizing our resources and putting more effort. I think that the health authority has uh, put in place recruitment officers in each zone, for example, and that would, those would be new. So people over, the, or, over the last year, are you able to provide, uh, provide the committee um, the figure, the dollar figure around the vacancies uh, that have been uh, that have been there for over the last year, or will I have to wait for for the uh, the budget estimates to get that number? Can you can you provide us a figure of what what the province has saved by vacancies last in the last fiscal year uh, when it comes to family doctors openings uh, here in the province? So. 
and I'll ask people to correct me here if I'm wrong, but the physician budget is a volume-driven budget. Is that there is an estimate of what the cost of physician services are in the province. That is part of the requirements of the Canada Health Act, that people access physician services, and those are publicly paid for dollars. So it's, it's a bit of an anomaly uh, compared to some other aspects of the budget where uh, some other budgets have hard caps on them. Generally speaking, physician services is a soft cap because it's driven by the need in the province and those payments are, being, are made because we're committed to public funding for insured physician services. If there is a discrepancy, uh, if, if there's a delta in a budget between a forecast and an actual, that's just a reflection of the forecast and the prediction of what the volume will be. There is no effort to uh, restrict the hiring of physicians in order to save money on that line. So, so I know that the government's moving in the direction that here's these vacancies. Physicians need to need to uh, sign on to uh, to the uh, to those positions in in the central zone, for example. Uh, there's 30 since January. Are, are you able? How many people applied for those jobs? Like, there's 58 in the in the province. Do you, are, can you give us a figure of how many physicians have applied? over the last six months uh, to, to, to the vacancy positions? Do you have those figures? And if not six months, actually in the last year would be very helpful. So the recruitment is managed by the health authority, so I'm just looking at Mr. Gast if he has those figures. If not, we'll, if not I'll make that inquiry. Mr. Guest? Just one, I, I know he was flipping the page, so maybe he found it there. I don't know. I, I, I can't give you specific numbers as to uh, uh, physicians who have expressed interest in uh, coming to uh, uh, work here in Nova Scotia. I can tell you that since April of 2015, we have hired 71 family physicians and 106 specialists. So the, the question, I think I've asked this before, is, is how, many, how many retired and how many left? Uh, do, do you have that on that, that, why wouldn't you have that right next to how many you hired? I mean, to me, uh, I mean, that makes sense. We, we need this. Uh, we hired this many. I mean, from my understanding, there's, uh, uh, there's another 20 some, almost 30 ready to retire just in central region from the, from the, from the information I, I have. So you don't keep that side by side? I, I'm a bit confused on why you wouldn't do that. So, so the numbers of uh, physicians that we're actively recruiting would include those as well as uh, uh, vacancies, positions that are open. Okay. It so, would consider both. So a position, uh, you know, in these collaborative clinics and, and the, the, uh, the, the path forward, if a physician is, is being asked to uh, provide care in a certain region, it goes along with kind of the geography of the, of the area, that you live in, will the patient, will that, will that doctor be able to bring the patients that they currently have with them uh, if they agree and sign on to one of these vacancy positions or, or will they, that, they, that, that patient wait list stay wherever that physician was practicing at the time or will they be able to bring the cur their current patients with them to a new position if they sign on uh, to one of the vacant uh, ones that are identified? Ms. Parrott. So my understanding is they could bring patients with them. We're not at a point in the system, though I read with interest this point in Doctors of Nova Scotia's um, uh, discussion paper, uh, we're not in a point where we're rostering patients, that we're assigning patients to physicians. Uh, so patients have mobility of seeking physician care But I know that, I mean, the vacant positions are in areas that, you know, pa the residents don't have a doctor. So, so Potentially, then, you're, so you're saying that there's no restrictions on doctors being able to pr bring their current patient uh, roster with them. Is that is that what I'm hearing? Unless someone corrects me, that is my understanding. I'm not aware of any restrictions in that. Okay. In that uh, with the uh, recent paper that I know it's just, mm -hmm. I don't know if it was yesterday or today. I got it yesterday. I don't know if that meant it was released yesterday, but uh, are, you, are you, is the department going to respond to this? And if so, what's the timeline on the response? So um, the department was very happy to receive the paper. We've had discussions with Doctors Nova Scotia saying that, um, or certainly I have, uh, saying we need to engage on policy discussions. So I think this is a very uh, positive initiative and will absolutely 
engage and, and have these discussions. Uh, and we appreciate this just like we do from other professions and, and frontline workers that have provided input into the system. So, so this, it's quite timely, uh, the paper, I think, and in a lot of, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, I just kind of went through it. Uh, there's about 10 recommendations, but many of them, you know, uh, can I, th I think can can assist the department uh, and the government in their attempt to uh, uh, ensure that Nova Scotians have access to family doctor and, and primary care clinicians. Um, so there's a bit of an urgency, I think, uh, especially when you look at some of the recommendations, like we recommend that walk-in clinics be maintained during the transition to a better primary health care system, and there's many more around funding and, and uh, as you mentioned, uh, making sure that current uh, Current residents who have doctors continue that if the doctor chooses to 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 move. So um, you can't give a timeline on on a response. Has the minister? Uh, I would assume the minister will get this today. Uh, and will you ask the minister? You know, uh, how long will we take to respond to uh, the paper that doctors in Nova Scotia released? So thank you for the question, and and you make an interesting point. I don't see it as a paper that gets an absolute response. I see it as a paper that starts a discussion and hopefully a collaborative discussion as we go forward. I want to say that um, I think from the department's perspective, we agree with those points made in the document. And, and I recall uh, the CEO of the Health Authority also indicating that we're not looking at sharp edges as we shift the system into collaborative care. We want the existing system to be stable. Uh, we want, and Ms. Knox acknowledged that physicians in solo practices, there'll still be new physicians coming in that replace those physicians when they retire in solo practices, that walk-in clinics do serve a purpose. Uh, absolutely, we're going to encourage linkages to the public and shift the system in a considered, careful way over time. Uh, I would hope that, that it, I hope that what you said isn't completely accurate, that it starts the discussion. I, I would hope now uh, that, uh, and I know you're new to the position, but I would hope that the current government uh, has been, you know, engaging with uh, with physicians and primary care physicians, family physicians over the last three, three and a half years, because I think this part of the paper, I think, is, 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 is the frustration. I think some of the physicians, family physicians have with the amalgamation of the District Health Authority and they're feeling not part of decision making and, and, and the new system and the road forward and the change of model of care will not be successful if it doesn't include those frontline health care uh, workers, frontline health care uh, physicians. Um, it's the models there. We've we've implemented it with the collaborative emergency center center model, and uh, unfortunately, I don't see the same thing happening here uh, when it comes to decision making. It seems like uh, physicians are required to act after decisions are being made. Um, just quickly, I want to go to uh, um, the mention of the agreement with the federal government, uh, or whatever it's going to be called, once the uh, once the legislation comes in, will will the terms of that agreement or that that um, legislation will that be released to the public? Uh, the terms that are involved in that, or will we see it in legislation, or is it going to be very vague? Is legislation going to be vague, or will the public get to see what was in the agreement that was signed in in December of 20, uh, 2016? Mr. Rafus. Uh, yes, you will. Uh, actually, in the budget that was tabled by the federal government, there is a provision in there to enable the flow of money. There will be uh, further, I would suspect, uh, uh, regulations that have to be developed at the federal level, and all federal uh, regulations in these matters are, are open to the public. So they will be available when they, uh, when they, when they uh, complete those. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We will move to the uh, Liberal Caucus. Mr. Rankin for 20 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this is a good report. This is, uh, in my three and a half years on the committee, I've, I've never seen the uh, completion rate uh, so high, so I think the department should be commended. But I want to ask uh, my first question to the, to the Deputy Auditor General, because uh, we had the in-camera session, so I don't want to uh, quote anything he had said in that, but what, what would you uh, attribute the, um, the vast improvement in the, uh, the follow-up recommendations from 2013 and 2014. Is this a, a good news story? Mr. Spicer. Thank you. 
Yes, overall, we, we, it is a good news story. I, I think the uh, the recommendations, uh, uh, we've plotted them in the report and they are moving in the right direction. Um, and uh, to your other point, I think there's a number of, of reasons you can point to as to why that might be. I think management of the various departments that uh, have done well need to be congratulated for that. And, and obviously they've, they've put a lot of effort and focus on making those recommendations work. The, uh, also, uh, I think, uh, as I mentioned, the, the Public Accounts Committee and other oversight bodies, uh, uh, oversight and accountability is an important control and tool to, to uh, helping uh, move these things along. So uh, I think uh, recognition of that effort has to be done as well. Okay, thank you. And I do think it's important to, uh, to recognize the management team. A lot of them are here today. Um, so the highest completion rate in 10 years, um, that's something to be... Um, proud of for the, from the department. So um, now questioning to the department, I'd like to start uh, with a similar type of question and what is attributing to the success of improving the, uh, the processes and procedures and, and implementing these recommendations, um, improvement of outcomes. Um, so on a broad level, is, uh, can we attribute some of that to the amalgamation of, of district health authorities? So maybe I'll ask the Deputy Minister of Health. Ms. Parrott. Um, so thank you for the question. I would say um, there two, side, two sides of that coin initially. I think the process of audits is an important process always. Uh, and having the recommendations come forward, the process of going through the audit um, is enlightening. And I think everyone learns from it. I think those are processes you want to embrace um, and, and take seriously. And clearly the department did that. I think then going through the amalgamation, you'll see a number of areas in the recommendations that do benefit from having both a consolidation of the health authority so that it operates with a, with a provincial focus, it has that platform, and also a clarity of role between the department and what it's doing and the health authority. So I, it, it, the short answer would be yes, I think that's been part of it. Okay, can you point to any tangible improvements um, when you look at the amalgamation of district health authorities, did the different de district health authorities have different um, policies and procedures? Was there any uh, internal competition when we're talking about whether it's physician recruitment or anything? It, it, does it in help improve? Um, can, you, can you point to any of the outcomes that we're seeing now? And uh, I'll dive deeper into the specifics of outcomes, but maybe we'll start with um, that and did we learn from other jurisdictions in terms of best practices? Um, I know you came from another province and I won't ask about um, that province, but um, do you sense that Nova Scotia has learned um, some things and how do you feel about um, the implementation of this uh, transformation thus far? Uh, so I'll give a general answer and then I'll ask Dr. Strang or Mr. Guest to, um, to fill it in. Um, clearly, when you're, especially when you're looking at wait times in the organization and developing efficiencies in surgical suites, having a province-wide perspective and being able to coordinate the response to that on a province basis uh, is clearly an advantage. And I think the same would be true with respect to population health, population health surveillance and the organization of that initiative. So I, I can ask them to be more specific if you like. Mr. Well, maybe, Guess? maybe we can oh, just talk about wait time since you mentioned that um, in the last three years. Have, are you able to point to any improvement? And uh, the one that MLAs I think hear most about, I, I do certainly, is knees and hips. Um, how is Nova Scotia doing? Um, have the wait lists improved or not? What are, what are the outcomes? Ms. Parrott. Thank you. So in all five priority areas that we focus when we're talking about wait times, uh, Nova Scotia showed improvement on all of them. I, I think it was the only province that improved on all because some, there were some backsliders in the group. Uh, and to improve, you have to have a, a significant process. Um, in areas such as radiation therapy, uh, cataract surgery, and hip fracture repair, the province is really showing good traction there and moving ahead. There is a way to go on on hip and knee surgeries, but again, I think the platform and the planning that's going on with the new health authority is setting the stage uh, for that progress to continue. And you had said, to put in context, that other provinces have not seen uh, improvement in their wait times. I know I saw a report last year where um, Canada in general, wait times were growing across the board. So 
we're in the Atlantic region where we face more challenges with the aging population. I think it's a thousand people a month now reaching the age of 65. So I just want to make sure I'm hearing that correctly. And I don't know if there's any um, anything that you can table that that actually shows that. Uh, notwithstanding our demographic challenges and um, other jurisdictions around us um, going up in wait times that we are actually uh, moving down and that's the trend and trends are important so I just want to make sure that we're under uh, I'm under the understanding that Nova Scotia wait lists are going down other jurisdiction wait lists are longer so not exactly okay um, in Nova Scotia, on all five of the areas where we measure wait times, uh, our wait lists are going down. We were the only province that showed progress on all five. There are other provinces that made progress on some. Uh, there are many that are ahead of us still, but, but all other provinces had a decline in some of their wait, line, wait lists is all I was pointing out. So the investment that we've made over the last number of years uh, the amalgamation of the health authorities and, and a greater platform for efficiency planning, it looks like that is paying off and that we are clearly moving in the right direction. Okay. We need, we, there's more to do yeah. and we need to keep at it. Yeah, obviously there's, there's always more to do. Um, so with the uh, recommendations uh, from the Auditor General, you know, you look at Chapter 6 and uh, there's progress here. Department of Health should obtain a signed letter from all physicians added to academic funding plans. That's done. Um, Department of Health should develop targets for all academic funding plan deliverables. That's done. I can go on and on. There's 12 or 13 that are all complete. Um, there's one that's not. So I think it's part of this committee's job to uh, help normalize when something's not complete. And uh, so the one that's not complete in Chapter 6 is the Department of Health and Wellness should have current signed contracts for all alternative payment plans and academic funding plans. So that's stated as not complete. Um, so again, to help normalize that uh, response, because I think you know there should be an opportunity to, to say where you are at that, what is sort of kind of a, a status update. Um, where are we at for uh, those signed contracts? Uh, maybe you can give some kind of data there or if there's a percentage of how many contracts are, are actually complete. So thank you for the question. In regard to uh, what you're referring to, the signed uh, contracts, I believe it's 593 have signed, seven have not. Uh, so it's largely completed. And I think reasonably to expect that those that have issues with it uh, we need to understand and address those issues. So there's a bit of a process involved. So that basically is over 90% of the, the contracts are done. So that recommendation is, is over 90% complete, even though in the, in the report it, it, it counts as a non-complete. Correct. Right. Okay, so let's look at some of the other um, recommendations. You have Chapter 4. Um, so looking at ones that are incomplete, 4.5, Department of Health and Wellness should implement recommendation 4.5 from the 2008 report to develop the electronic immunization registry. And I think you referred to some progress in your opening remarks. Uh, I could be wrong, but uh, the panoramics, does that relate to that recommendation? So is there any status update for that recommendation? So the province is proceeding to implement panorama, panorama which will give us an an immunization and vaccine inventory uh, by this fall, and I'll ask uh, Dr. Strang to comment. Dr. Strang. Thank you, yes, so we are in the process now of uh, a two-year project implementing Panorama. Uh, one of the components will be uh, a vaccine, uh, uh, managing our, our inventory of vaccines, as well as uh, developing capacity for public health delivered vaccines to be entered electronically. Uh, moving forward from Panorama, uh, then we need to then uh, do the work as we develop the one patient, one record, linking uh, uh, vaccine records from um, primary care providers, including doctors and pharmacists. Uh, and so ultimately we will have a complete vac immunization registry. We already are linking in the primary care providers who have, uh, who are on the EMR, we are uh, accessing their data around immunization. Um, 
So I just want to make sure people understand that Panorama itself doesn't produce a complete immunization registry. It's the first step, and then we link in other, uh, immun other sources of immunization data as we uh, move forward on the one patient, one record. And, and where are we with the one patient, one record? I think that's a, a huge benefit to the system for more coordination, and I think it relates to the district health authority being one and uh, sending you know, electronic messages from family physicians to, uh, to whatever surgeon or operating room that a patient arrives at. Um, do we have any sense of timeline when we're going to be able to um, see that come to fruition? Ms. Perrin. Um, so my understanding, so that is moving ahead, uh, and, and people are quite excited about it. The request for supplier qualifications was issued in January 2017 um, and attracted uh, a good response. Those responses are being evaluated, so this project is moving uh, ahead. It's hard to comment on it when it's in a controlled supplier environment right now. Okay. Um, so any of the other recommendations, I guess I'll just ask for a, a status update. Department of Health and Wellness should develop a plan to implement um, public health protocols following approval. The plan should include detailed timelines and involve input from stakeholders impacted by the new protocols. Is there any kind of a, a status update on that? Dr. Strang? So the public health protocols are, are part of our ongoing work with between the department and the Nova Scotia Health Authority. Uh, they're not a time limited project and that's why it's listed as ongoing. There will always be work ensuring that we are, uh, are the work of public health is guided by what's in the protocols uh, and, and, and periodically revisiting those protocols to make sure they're up to date. One of the things we have done during the uh, transition from nine health authorities to one, there's a significant amount of work that's been done internally within the Nova Scotia Health Authority uh, Public Health, uh, um, moving, uh, creating greater consistency uh, across the province in, in within public health on, uh, and, and one of the key pieces uh, that are using to drive that consistency is the protocol. So moving towards um, a public health practice that is more consistent and more in line with the public health protocols. Okay, thank you. Um, maybe you can tell us more of the upcoming clinical services planning framework for surgery, which determines the services that will be offered in each location. Ms. Parrott. To uh, Mr. Guest. Mr. Guest. Uh, we, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, thank you. Uh, we're actively uh, working on uh, developing a uh, service plan uh, that meets the, the needs of the population uh, and looking to make sure that uh, the service offerings that we have uh, in each of our facilities uh, enable that to happen now and into the future. Okay. And in terms of surgery scheduling, um, with the District Health Authority amalgamating into one, um, is that facilitating a, a broad uh, strategy in terms of the provincial lens, or is it is that Im being improved through the amalgamation as well? Mr. Guest? Um, yes, uh, we have uh, recently uh, been able to operationalize a, an organization-wide program for surgery, uh, and we now have the medical leadership uh, in place, uh, largely, uh, as well as the operational leadership in place to be able to have a structure <laughs> To, uh, to revise, create, and, and uh, review our policy, our, our protocols, and uh, our uh, program, uh, looking at it from a system perspective and not the nine entities that we came from. Uh, and so that will be a real enabler to help us uh, do that work. Does that include when a surgeon is working in, I know that there was challenges moving people from district health authorities to another one, and does this uh, amalgamation facilitate uh, uh, an easier move if someone had to go to a surgery in a different zone. Is that more streamlined now? Uh, yes, uh, our credentialing process within the organization has uh, certainly made that easier. I can give you an example. Uh, last year we had uh, uh, at the Colchester site in Turo uh, a number of uh, uh, surgeons uh, that uh, uh, our, our capacity was low there. We weren't maximizing the uh, OR time we had, so we did have uh, 20 days that uh, surgeons from Halifax went to Turo. They did 104 surgeries and over 400 endoscopy procedures during those 20 days. 
Okay. Is there any other progress in terms of when, at the hospital level, when uh, a patient, say, at, I know at one time a doctor had to sign the release to allow a patient to leave. Is uh, are we able to uh, say that we're uh, freeing up? space for doctors to, to be somewhere else and, and have a nurse practitioner, for example. Uh, I know that that was something that was worked on and I, I brought it to the department's attention before. So uh, is that now in, under implementation? I, I would say that that's ongoing work uh, and we certainly do that uh, in a programmatic way uh, that's very intentional. Um, and so I, I wouldn't say that it's complete. Uh, we would be uh, doing that work really uh, on a priority basis as uh, the need for it determines. Okay. Um, and is there anything else that you can point to in terms of um, whether it's alternate system delivery or <laughs> coordinated care that, uh, that's imp improving outcomes, but at the same time, you know, being responsible with the, f the financial um, envelope that we have? Yeah, I can certainly speak from a, a surgery perspective. Um, Looking at uh, at uh, the service fully as a system certainly has enabled us to maximize more um, uh, the resources that we have, and uh, I can give you a couple of examples. Uh, well, the, the Colchester example is one. Another example is maximizing how we use the Hans Community Hospital so that uh, we can do more surgeries in that location to allow the prime operating room capacity in Halifax to be used for higher. Uh, 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 more complicated surgeries. Uh, we're, we're looking at doing that as much as we can. Another example in the western zone is that we um, provide a zone-based uh, service for orthopedics, where orthopedic surgeons from Kentville do procedures in both Bridgewater and Yarmouth to maximize uh, the available resources we have, minimize travel whenever possible, uh, also enable them to, to use the Kentville OR time for the types of procedures that only that facility is able to do. Okay, and as that relates to the QE2 VG redevelopment and um, building infrastructure outside of the peninsula, is there still uh, an appetite to, to look at um, facilities outside of the core of um, the city, and uh, I speak, I brought this up before, but uh, the Halifax West Zone um, is where the growth is in HRM, um, you know, ultimately something in the same form of Cobequit uh, Centre, like an outpatient type centre, which uh, I see is uh, more efficient and better utilization of um, um, FTEs within the system, is that is there still an appetite to move in that direction? Um, certainly with that, that planning is ongoing. Um, what we are looking philosophically at is um, doing the, the work that needs to be in the hospital setting, in the hospital setting, and where possible moving uh, care that can be done safely and, and uh, with high quality into the community setting into the, into the community. Um, the the Cobbequid example you speak of is a really good example of how that su successfully can be done, and that is one one of the planning parameters in the QE2 redevelopment project. I would also add that one other philosophical approach that we're taking is by maximizing the capacity in some of our regional hospitals in the province. It will allow us to slow uh, the transfer of care to Halifax when it appropriately can be done out in those regional centres to allow Halifax to focus on uh, quaternary tertiary care that uh, only they are capable of doing. And that will, in your view, improve the quality of care? I think it'll improve, it'll improve the quality of, of care, it'll improve access, um, and I think it will help us to, to have a more stable uh, perioperative program across the province. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We'll move back to uh, the PC caucus. Mr. Houston for 13 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We've seen the Premier making a lot of announcements over the last five or six weeks, the last, even the last couple of days, a lot around um, health care. And I just wonder, when the Premier makes announcements like he did yesterday around bricks and mortar, is he kind of picking off a list that you've put forward? Have you put forward a, a, a list of capital priorities? And is, are the announcements we're seeing, let's say, in the last two or three days, are they just following your capital priority list? That's for the Deputy. Ms. Perrette? <clears throat> Order. 
Uh, just hold for one moment. We just want to wait until your mic turns on. Ms. Peratt. Thank you. Um, the capital planning process is a um, inclusive process that involves the health authority, the department, and communities and, and community health advisory boards. So the lists that go together, some of them are long-standing lists that projects have been on uh, for a number of years. So I think uh, all of the projects we're seeing going ahead have been identified before. Yeah, uh, and can you table a list of maybe the, the top 15 capital uh, projects according to that process? Would you have that a list? This is not part of capital planning. Yeah, it's kind of problems, problems. Yeah. So I'm just conferring with, with my colleague. I think that will be <coughs> part of the information that comes forward when the budget is tabled. Well, if it's a long-standing process and some of them have been on there for a while, presumably there is a list and has been a list. Can you give me the list from six months ago then or something? Yeah. Mr. Rafus. Uh, so just to, to clarity, is, uh, that <coughs> process that the deputy spoke about uh, does feed into the uh, what we refer to as the TCA uh, a, a committee, which <coughs> makes a recommendation into Treasury Board. Uh, that information <coughs> that comes in there, it is subject to co uh, cabinet confidentiality, as we've uh, discussed <coughs> before, and we have discussed with the Auditor General. So we do have limitations on what is okay. can be provided. There's a there's a if I think about schools, there's a known process for schools. We know that this government jumped that process and put schools where they where they wanted to for political purposes. Is there anything you can tell me that would dispel my concerns that that's what's happening, um, e even if you think about the couple announcements over or yesterday? Were yesterday's announcements the top two on the list? As the deputy indicated, those uh, items were on uh, the, uh, uh, the prioritized list coming up from the department. Some of them are long-standing. Um, uh, those are the ones that have been chosen to, to, be, to be advanced. Okay, so we can't see the list. We take it at face value that they're on a list somewhere. Where they're on that list, who knows? It's at the, it's at the cabinet's discretion as to where they do the projects. Is that a fair summary? Yeah, the, uh, in the democratic process we have, uh, the cabinet and treasury board has the <coughs> the obligation uh, to or the right to make those decisions. Okay, make there's make nothing you can share with this with this committee which discusses the finances of the province. There's nothing you can share with this committee that would alleviate my concern that we're just seeing purely political decisions uh, made on the eve of an election. Is there's nothing you can share with us that would say, well, no, 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 this is the process and can't do it, right? I can tell you that those uh, announcements have been uh, were are accommodated in our fiscal <coughs> plan and in, our, in the capital plan of the province. Okay, let's think about one of the announcements yesterday. Uh, a fiscal plan implies that there's some costing around it. The premier premier made an announcement yesterday. He said, "I don't know when it's going to how much it's going to cost or when it's going to get done, but I'm here to announce it today." Breezing in on the even election to tell people that he's got some some goodies for them. Certainly, your fiscal plan probably has things costed, no? Yeah, the announcement yesterday you're referring to uh, pug well, Pugwash or down in yeah. the, down yeah. in, in so, Bridgewater. As with all major capital projects, uh, there is uh, various stages and various uh, and levels of certainty about the costing. Uh, the certainty of these projects will not be known until uh, the complete planning is, 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 is finalized. We do make provisions on the capital plan and the out years knowing that that commitment has been made but it's based on the information we have. We tend not to want okay. to release those numbers because they are subject to finalization of community involvement, physician involvement, and the final design of those facilities. With the issues, the serious issues we have in healthcare in this province, it, it strikes me as odd uh, that the Premier would be running around announcing things that he doesn't know how much they're gonna cost or when they're gonna happen, and not actually focusing on Hey, how about we get some doctors so people can see an actual primary care physician? Does that strike you as odd? Uh, no, actually, that sounds to me to be prudent, uh, to be, uh, not be throwing out numbers okay. which you can't be validated. Okay, it's not, I don't see the prudence in, in announcing things that you can't cost, but uh, whatever. Uh, I'd call it political. I wouldn't call it prudent. Um, so um, we'll move on from that. Uh, we, we know political announcements are being made. We know they're not costed. We know they may or may not happen. Maybe, maybe someday every Nova Scotian will have a doctor. That was going to happen in 2014. It's now going to happen in maybe 2019, but prudence not a word I would use for what's, what's happening. We, um, we know the federal government is going to take some action around 
the legalization of marijuana. I'd just like to ask the Deputy of Health a quick question. Have you done any analysis of what the possible costs to the healthcare system might be uh, coming out of the legalization of marijuana over the next five or 10 year period? Have you done any kind of costing as what it may, is or would there be a cost? Common, uh, common knowledge suggests that there will be some cost to the healthcare system uh, of legalizing marijuana. I guess maybe I'll start with, do you agree with that or not? Ms. <coughs> Ms. Parrott? I'm going to refer the question to Dr. Okay. Strang, who's been leading this. <clears throat> Dr. Strang? So no, there hasn't been any uh, costing done because we don't know the, the, the regulatory framework under which cannabis will be legalized. There's a lot of detail which needs to be, uh, come from the federal government. There are significant uh, decisions which have to be made uh, here provincially. Uh, but I think just we need to understand that there is no lack of access and therefore use of cannabis today and our objectives that have been approved by cabinet under legalizing cannabis will be to protect, first and foremost, protect the, the, the health and the safety of, of the Nova Scotia public, as well as to decrease uh, the, the input of, or the, the footprint of organized crime. So uh, depending on what, if we adhere to those objectives, uh, we will actually get decreased uh, use and overuse of cannabis, and therefore presumably decreased health and criminal justice and other costs. It all depends on how what decisions are made around how we regulate this. Okay, so is that your is that your succinct? Uh, if I just tried to, in the interest of time, boil it down, you'd say legalization of marijuana will result in less use and less overuse of marijuana. Depends on how it's legalized. Depends on what framework we know okay. and how it's how it's how it's sold and, and presumably the, where it's sold and age would be the two. Would they be the two influencers of how you uh, where you of your kind of guess on what happens? Where it's sold, what age, how we allow, do we allow marketing, a whole range of decisions that have to be made both federally and uh, okay. provincially. And we look at other substances like tobacco and alcohol and other things. That do you have any thoughts on the age? I heard 18 is what the feds are going to go with. Is that, do you have any, any opinion on if that's too high, the, too low? What? The discussion we've had and, and then the direction from cabinet has been that Nova Scotia should stick with a minimum age of 19 and if there is opportunities to move higher than that in collaboration with other provinces to do so. Okay, okay. Um, question, thank you for that. Question, um, what's the average length of time that a physician vacancy remains vacant in Nova Scotia? Do we have a, an average length of time for, does it take a year to fill them or six months to fill them or do we have an average length of time? Dr. Perrette, or Ms. Perrette. <coughs> thank you for the promotion. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna, I'm going to look to, to Mr. Guest if he can fill this in, but, but the point I want to make at the outset is um, the, process of, the process of enrolling, having a list of patients looking for doctors. So remember, we've been... Uh, the question, we, just in the interest of time, the question is how long does the position stay vacant? Well, part of the answer is that mm. this is not a new issue, it's a long-standing issue. So there should be more evidence as to how long. <laughs> and starting in this province last year is the first time we've put together a list and, and the first time that it's been <clears throat> tracked. So it's still relatively early days of starting a process that's very intentional about uh, tracking the need and starting to link need uh, to community demand. Um, so I'm not aware that there is, in this short period of time, an average period that's been tracked, but I'll let Mr. Guest correct me if I'm wrong. Mr. Guest? That, that would be correct. At, at this point, uh, I'm not able to respond Too to that. Too early to say. Okay, f fair enough. Um, too early to say. So uh, I do want to ask a question about um, um, payments to specialists in this, in this province. Is there something happening where the health authority or the department is withholding back a certain amount of monies due to specialists, 10%? Is the, is the, are you aware of that happening, that specialist remuneration is being held back by 10%? Ms. Parrott? Sorry, I'm, I'm going to refer it uh, to David. Mr. Bartol? The AFP contract uh, provides for a holdback of 10% um, that's uh, managed within the departments. Okay, so, so is, that, 
Is that new or old or? That's new in this, in this current agreement. Okay, so in this new agreement, uh, there's a holdback of 10% on monies that are due for services that were rendered, right? The services would have been rendered, but they're holding back 10%. It's it's a it's a holdback within the AFP department's uh, uh, pending uh, confirmation of uh, fulfillment of deliverable de okay. deliverables. Yes, and so it's managed within the department. Yes. Do you have a sense as to whether specialists are happy with that or not happy with that? <clears throat> All I can say is that the AFP <clears throat> contract was ratified to 87 percent of favorability by the AFP okay. physicians. We haven't heard uh, uh, any statements of unhappiness around that, that those practices. Okay, okay, fair enough. Um, I do want to talk, I just want to try and understand the targeted funding from the federal government. It was kind of advertised over the Christmas holidays as I think 287 million, which was 150 for home care and 130 some odd for mental health. You familiar with the number, Deputy Rafe, 287 million, is that over? Is that over 10 years? I know you don't want to get into the specific annual amounts, but it, it, that's the number that was published. <clears throat> Mr. Rafuse? Uh Yeah, those would have been 10-year uh, amounts that we were Over saying. 10 years, okay. So uh, I know you can't say how much of that is, is going to happen this year and next year and stuff until the, until the budget comes, I guess. But, but is, there, is, there a, is there any science behind that? Is there a plan for, well, gee, if we had a uh, hundred and fifty million for home care, we could really, we could do this or we could do that, or was it just a number went down on a piece of paper and the minister said, sure. Is there a plan for that? The, the, the plan to use that money would be uh, uh, within the Department of Health. This is an allocation <clears throat> based on a, a federal transfer and the dollars attached to it. How that money is used and the reporting back to that's a separate uh, uh, um, uh, initiative all. It only have a minute, uh, Deputy. Does the Department of Health have a have a plan that to use the how those monies will be used, and can they share that plan with us, Ms. Parrott? Thank you. Uh, so the, our understanding from the federal government is that they want to put in place an accountability framework that will have specific. Mm -hmm. um, I'll use the word eligible, though I don't know if that's entirely the correct word. Um, types of activities that will be eligible for the funding. So we don't even know. So, we have so they want to know how you spent it. I'm wondering how you're planning to spend it, and you're saying we don't know how we're going to spend it until they say how we can spend it. They need, they need to give us the parameters of what projects or types of projects that they consider eligible for that type of funding. They haven't, they haven't done that. They haven't done it yet, no. It's been five months, is that not uncommon or order? Time has expired, we'll move to the NDP caucus. Mr. Wilson, you have 13 minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. In the uh, Auditor General's uh, report uh, for the chapter one of the follow-up for uh, recommendations from 2013 and 14, uh, it indicated concerns remained with uh, some organizations and one was with the Nova Scotia Health Authority that it has not established targets leaving Nova Scotians unsure when surgery wait times uh, will improve. And I know in uh, 2013, Steve McNeil, uh, our current Premier, promised to reduce wait times uh, and that he would uh, put in $8.1 million uh, to operating rooms to ensure that the province meets the six months uh, standard for hip and knee replacement. We know now, I think uh, hip is around 17 months and knees are around 20. Um, just wondering if that $8.1 million uh, was invested uh, in the operating rooms over the mandate of, uh, of the current government. Ms. Parrott? Um, so again, I'll ask Mr. Guest to, to go into more specifics, but yes, I believe that the investment that's been made to reduce wait times, uh, the value of that investment is being seen in the reduction of wait times and, and progress is being made. But Mr. Mr. Guest? Guest, you might elaborate. Uh, thank you. Um, we, uh, the, the uh, access to the additional money did have an impact in um, our volumes. Uh, we, um, in 2015, 2016, were able to do 614 uh, uh, procedures for individuals who were uh, waiting longer than a year. In uh, this current fiscal year uh, ending in March, uh, we increased that to uh, 855. This would be the first 
first year we've been able to spend the uh, full allotment that we were given out of the $8.1 million. Uh, we did request additional money from uh, the department and were given access uh, to, uh, to do that, which did uh, enable us to get to that 855. So, so there has been a reduction, but, but part of the commitment from the Premier was to, to meet the six months uh, wait time targets. And, you know, the Auditor General saying that the Department or Health Authority won't even establish if they agree or don't agree with making those targets. So, so is, it, uh, is it that the Health Authority is pushing back on, uh, on, uh, on the commitment from the Premier, or is it that the Premier really... Uh, probably should have never made that commitment to Nova Scotians because it's not, uh, it's not reality uh, with the, the funding formula that, uh, that uh, Treasury and that the current government's giving towards trying to meet that six months, uh, that six months uh, target that, uh, you know, that provinces are trying to reach. So uh, are you concerned that that's, you haven't fulfilled uh, the Premier's province or, or promise, or is that something that I think the Premier probably should have not made that promise to Nova Scotians? Mr. Guest. Uh, thank you. I, I can't comment uh, on the Premier's comment. I, I've not heard them. Uh, what I can say is that uh, we uh, are in the process of putting in place targets. We intend to be fully compliant with the Auditor General's recommendations by the fall of this year. Uh, we have said all along that this is going to be a, a, a uh, lengthy process to meet the national benchmark. We have a ways to go. We're headed in the right direction, which is a big change from two years ago when we continued to get worse year over year. Um, I think um, uh, it's going to take some uh, a change in how we do business in order to, to meet the target, but it is our goal to get there. Um, we believe it is the right thing for Nova Scotians to do, uh, but it's not going to be an easy road. I appreciate that, and, and I think that's definitely misguided on the Premier's, uh, premier's uh, side to, to try to uh, state that. Uh, of course, the other area, of, of course, is the commitment for a doctor for no, every Nova Scotian that the Premier uh, indicated prior to becoming Premier of this province. And I know uh, that his commitment was to open up uh, medical spots, I believe it was 25 a year, uh, so in year four there'd be a hundred potentially uh, as we move forward. Of course they don't start practicing right away, they got to finish their, uh, finish their, uh, their schooling. So has that commitment been kept and uh, are we going to see a benefit from uh, an additional hundred spots? Are we, uh, is, the, is the Premier at a position that he can check that box off as he goes and asks for another mandate? Uh, for Nova Scotians, from Nova Scotians. Ms. Perrett? Um, so, so the answer to that question is something that I have to follow up on. So you're not, you're not sure if the 25 spots per year were, were, were added to Dalhousie. So I'll, I'll take you on that and, uh, and uh, hopefully we'll find out uh, sooner than later. Uh, in August of 2015, the Premier said that he was opposed to the federal government um, providing health funding uh, to the provinces based on population without taking the aging demographics into account. And we know, uh, we know that uh, Nova Scotians' uh, demogra aging demographic is, is, we have one of the oldest populations. So did the government uh, ask the federal government to change the funding formula to take into account Nova Scotians' aging uh, population? I think uh, my colleague will take that. Mr. Rafus? Uh, certainly, it's, uh, it's quite well known that a uh, strict uh, per capita funding formula does come to the detriment of, of provinces like ourselves who, uh, uh, who have an aging demographic. Uh, unfortunately, it, you can't get agreement across uh, the country uh, where other provinces are quite adamant well, where a strict per capita is the way to go. Uh, therefore, it, it would be to our benefit because it does reflect our reality but you, you, you could not get agreement. There are some provinces that are adamant not to shift off this. And I, and I understand that, but we, we didn't negotiate a health uh, agreement with the other provinces. We did it on our own. So did, did the province ask the federal government to take into account the aging population of our province? I mean, getting agreement from across the province 
doesn't doesn't matter because we didn't we didn't work with them to get our agreement in the first place. So, did was there a request from the team of negotiators that Nova Scotia would like to see uh, our uh, aging population factor into the formula for uh, for health transfers? That was a request for the change, but it is, that is a national agreement. The yeah. CHT is a is a national agreement. Right, the federal. Uh, I know the federal minister uh, was very vocal, uh, public publicly indicated that. Uh, when she goes to the finance minister uh, to ask for more money, she needs to be able to tell that uh, her minister uh, that the money will be used uh, for health care. So over the last two and a half years, I know uh, under the current government, there has been an underspending of health budgets. 22 million, I believe, last year or two years ago, and then 23 million. So about $45 million underspent in, in, in two years. And then, of course, we know uh, also uh, around the health infrastructure budget that was severely underspent. I believe over the last, through the mandate of the government, there was about $140, $150 million uh, in the budget for that, and I think 70, 75 million was spent. So does that weaken our position uh, when we were negotiating with the federal government to say we need more money in Nova Scotia, not only to meet our aging population, the demographics, but we're, the government, I mean the federal minister is saying that we need to show that money is going to health care, yet here in Nova Scotia we've underspent significantly, I would say, in a number of areas, uh, the budget. So would that weaken our position in, in trying to, to ask for more funding uh, for Nova Scotians when we were negotiating with the federal government? Um, that never did in the, entered in the conversation with the federal government. we well aware that we based our projections based on actual spending, not for uh, actuals versus budget. It, the trends that were developed uh, in response to, or, uh, or to develop a position uh, between all provinces looked at national trends as well as provincial trends. So no, it did not factor into the conversation. Hence why maybe we, we may have jumped the gun on on, uh, on negotiating with the province. And I, didn't, I know my colleague, and I would agree with my colleague when he said, I think we put uh, uh, the rest of the provinces at a disadvantage, jumping so quickly a couple days before Christmas. So when I talked about the infrastructure budget, for, for example, um, hospital infrastructure budgets uh, were significantly underspent. Across three years of budgets, there was 146 million, but only 72 million uh, was spent. And uh, we just heard yesterday uh, from the Premier that uh, a replacement for the Pugwash Hospital uh, is a commitment from the government. Uh, and I think I heard uh, construction in 2018. Um, why would we underspend the budget for three years and then on an eve of an election commit to people in Pugwash we're going to replace, uh, replace their hospital? Or, you know, are, are Nova Scotia supposed to just take the Premier at his word uh, that most likely there's an election between now and construction of the Pugwash Hospital. Uh, are Nova Scotia just supposed to take the Premier at his word and, and, ho and roll the dice and hopefully they'll commit to this? Because there's, I have to say, there's a number of examples that, you know, the Premier has said many things prior to getting elected. You know, doctors for every Nova Scotian, you know, uh, film tax credit would be uh, supported and maintained. Um, ER closures, we'd continue to make sure that there was a reduction in ER closures, and, and I think I could go on and on, but why would, why would we underspend the infrastructure budget for three years, but yet today, or yesterday, the Premier is announcing a, a replacement of a new hospital, and actually telling a construction time. Is that, do you see concerns there, and maybe, uh, maybe that it is really just about an, a pending election, and not really the needs uh, of, of communities in, in the province? I don't know if the Deputy, Deputy Minister of Health would like to answer that. Um, I, I have a perspective. But... So I think my colleague... Ms. Parrott. Sorry, I'm, I think my colleague would like to answer the question. I haven't been part of the capital planning process for a number of years, so he can probably provide a better perspective. Mr. Rafus. Uh, it, it just, you are true. The, uh, the underspend in the, in the health capital has uh, happened all the last couple of years. The understanding we have is uh, when the department reports into us is that uh, as the system is going through uh, uh, a, a major uh, administrative reorganization and as they uh, 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 go forward on their health services planning, uh, you do need to pause on things to make sure that you're doing the right things. And that was the reason why the underspends occurred. 
So, so I know in the announcement, it, it, the Premier indicated construction in 2018, but yet we, we know that uh, the Centennial Building has been uh, at the forefront for, for a number of years now for, for need of a replacement, but yet there's no uh, timeline on when we will see construction happening uh, with the transition of, of services out of the Centennial Building. What, can you give us an update on, on when, uh, when those services and, and when will we see uh, bricks and mortar for the replacement of, of the Centennial uh, building in, at the VG site? Ms. Barrett? Um, so I don't have a timeline for you, uh, but I can tell you that the planning uh, for the QE2 project uh, is, uh, is very intense and is going ahead um, at speed. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. You have about 30 seconds. Uh, well, it's, it's interesting that the Premier can tell us construction timeline on one, one project, yet not give us the budget for it, but yet a project that's been in the works for years now, we still don't know where those services are going to go or where, uh, where uh, we may see a new, uh, new facility uh, being opened up. Obviously, uh, it's evident. Uh, the evidence has shown that the, uh, the Premier and the current government has have not put in place priority on health care here in Nova Scotia. And Order. And time has expired. We'll move to the uh, Liberal Caucus and Mr. Stroink. Thank you very much for uh, coming again today. Um, I guess I want to kind of have a discussion on on the transfers that come from Ottawa and how do we um, how do we derive to those numbers, and also a little bit of a historic piece to this too, because under under the PC federal government. There was a significant unilateral decision on health transfer costs, and, and so that Nova Scotia can understand where we are today. Can you explain what happened, and how we got to to the number that we're at, kind of now? Uh, that would be a great kind of segue into the questions that I kind of have for you today, Mr. Rafus. Uh, thank you. I'm going to start, and then maybe I'll ask Lalani to fill in a bit here. But uh, certainly, uh, there was uh, under, the, under the previous uh, government there, uh, there was a change in way in which the formula was. There was a, a build an escalator of six percent. Uh, that government chose to unilaterally change it uh, away from that uh, and into a, a strict per capita spending. Um, and those those uh, those agreements or those uh, were enshrined in legislation until 2024. Um, I can give you some uh, historical pattern, but I'm going to ask maybe ask Lalani to fill in what I've missed, or maybe fill in that in a bit better than that. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ms. Kumarinayaki. So, uh, as we discussed, the uh, current agreement is a 10-year agreement that lasts till 23-24. So, um, there was no impetus for the federal government to uh, negotiate this at its current time, apart from looking at the priorities and the needs. Uh, one, one thing that was really significant is in 17-18, the 6% escalator, so the way the CHT transfer works is there is a pool of money and it is allocated across the provinces uh, purely on a per capita formula that was brought in by the Harper government. Um, the second change, which was going to com is going to com commence this year, 1718, is that that escalator it will be reduced to a three-year moving average with a minimum of three percent. This year, it'll kick in at three percent. So, were there no changes, uh, uh, the pro all the provinces would be stand, stand uh, the growth in our, our transfers uh, would uh, reduce, uh, and we estimated that would be over 20 million for for Nova Scotia. Um, with this new uh, Liberal government in, in, in Ottawa, uh, there was an ability to be able to uh, discuss and look at what are some of the priorities and say our current growth in, in health care transfers is, is going down because of the previous government's changes in the escalator. Um, however, we do have needs, and this is how the uh, discussions around more targeted funding have arisen, um, and it's anticipated that the federal government will be spending about $11 billion uh, in, in addition uh, uh, to the CHT transfer. So it was more uh, with the Liberal government, it was the Feds, um, it was more of a bit of a no negotiation on how the provinces can utilize those money. So what, in those two aspects, what did uh, Nova Scotia get in those, in those um, negotiations uh, with the Liberal Feds? So we, we will still continue to have our base transfer, the CHT transfer. Uh, 
the benefit for provinces of that base transfer, so that's 967 uh, million for next year, is that's an unconditional transfer. So that's used uh, uh, as part of our 4.3 billion budget, but it's used according to the priorities that we have. Um, in addition, there is this targeted uh, funding, uh, particularly uh, for mental health, etc., and. Uh, those envelopes are currently being negotiated. Deputy Perrette spoke about uh, the discussions are ongoing as to what those are eligible programs are. And we anticipate there will be a federally tar uh, legislation for this targeted funding um, coming in, in, through this budget implementation process. Thank you very much. And I guess um, that's kind of all I have now for the transfers. I might come back to you on another question. But I guess um, my question now is for the Deputy Minister of Health. The question that people need to understand is, yeah, we ha I hear it a lot, is the wait times for hips and knees are, are an issue in Nova Scotia, but there's a historical factor that people aren't understanding. How did we get to, to where we are today? Like, how did we get this massive backlog with hips and knees? Ms. Perret? <coughs> uh, so I think there's a combination of factors um, that you would see across the country, because the reason you have this focus on five weightless factors is it wasn't an issue just for Nova Scotia it was an issue across the country and and part of that is the complexity of running uh, the hospital systems uh, the increased demand I think over and I'm not sure what the timeline is the increased demand for hips and knee surgeries across the country uh, it was quite a dramatic incline and, and so the system has been responding to increased demand um, and, and the need to become more efficient. So you see initiatives like Nova Scotia's undergone with a consolidated health authority to create that platform for more efficiency in different provinces as well. But, but a number of factors in play. So on the list right now, we had such a massive backlog um, of, of patients to have the surgeries. Where are we now compared to where we were four years ago? So I'm going to refer refer it to Mr. Guest, because I know there was an emphasis on what they called the long waiters to deal with that first. Mr. Guest. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for the question. Uh, since 2012, um, our uh, volumes of uh, procedures that we've done for hips have increased by 7%. Uh, our volumes of knees have increased by 10%. Those are the numbers that we were performing. Um, there has been a subsequent increase in demand on the hip side. Uh, on the knee side, uh, in that time frame, it's gone down by 1%, and so it's, it's enabled us to, to start to catch up there. Um, we have had a, a, a higher pr uh, focus on knees uh, during this time frame because our wait list for individuals waiting for knees is con considerably longer than hips, and they're waiting a considerably longer period of time. Um, and, and so um, I would say that um, we, we are starting to be able to, to see a dent uh, in the wait list, uh, but uh, you know, it's going to take a, a considered effort for us to be able to tackle that backlog. Um, this, the, this year and the previous year was the first year we've actually not seen the list grow. Uh, which has been a, a considerable uh, uh, change in, in what was happening before. I, I can add a comment to your, your previous comment about how we got here. Yeah. Um, in the previous, uh, prior to the, the establishment of the Nova Scotia Health Authority, the, nine different, uh, the previous nine districts all had different sets of priorities uh, of which uh, they prioritized their resources. They weren't all aligned. Um, we also had challenges with health human resources. We've had issues with anesthesia coverage over the last uh, uh, five, ten years uh, that, that ebbs and flows. We've had nursing shortages in some areas of the province uh, in the ORs, particularly uh, a couple of the previous district health authorities prior to uh, the establishment of the long waiter strategy had caps on their surgeries because of funding. And so there's a multitude of reasons why the backlog has grown. Moving to one uh, district health authority with one set of priorities, one set of processes, um, and, and dealing with all of those issues the same certainly is an enabler for us to be able to, to do a better job of dealing with that issue. So what I just heard is what, what this government has done by changing it to one health authority has significantly helped the processes within, within the health authority in hips and knee surgeries as an example. Is that, is that a fair statement to say? 
I would say that it's, it's given us the opportunity to have a consistent approach with how we, we allot resources uh, so that we are all steering the boat in the same direction with the same goal. Uh, that's, uh, I think, the biggest contribution to what it's enabled us to do. So also, um, I guess, on that long, the long waiters list, are there people on that list that are on the list who've been there for a very, very long time? but are on that list for health reasons and until their significant health changes or their health issues changes um, then they'll be able to have their their surgery is that is that a, some of that happening on that list um, according to policy in order to be on the list you have to be eligible and ready to have your surgery at any given time there are uh, uh, periods when an individual goes on the list that their health uh, status changes. Uh, and according to our, uh, the, the government policy related to uh, being on the wait list, the timeline should cease and it starts to count again once they're, they're considered medically uh, eligible to have their surgery. We're doing a, a significant uh, amount of work uh, making sure that the list is accurate um, and, uh, and we, we've done a lot of cleanup. Uh, I can say that in, since 2012 uh, we have decreased the longest waiting individual on the wait list by 29%. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, back, to, back to Mr. Rafe. Mr. Rafe, what um, in the upcoming budget there was uh, an initiative on this, the small business tax um, that's occurring. Can you just explain to uh, uh, what that what that initiative is, Mr. Rafe? Yes, uh, the Minister of Finance announced uh, that in the upcoming budget, the, um, the threshold for small business, uh, uh, where the business is eligible for the small business tax rate, will be raised uh, from the current level of $350,000 to, to $500,000. So those businesses that meet certain criteria, that income level now will, will reduce from the general rate to the small business rate. And then also the small business tax would be decreased by... No, the small business rate will stay the same. Okay. It, yes, it is. But so, it is we'll, yeah, so will that? So what I'm trying to get at here is: Are most doctors self-employed? Um, I think all doctors are self-employed, but most uh, most of them, a lot of them, are incorporated uh, uh, professionals. If that's what you're asking. Yeah. yeah. So, and I guess, and that's so. What I'm trying to get at is: This new tool uh, is this a great new tool for to recruit doctors uh, into Nova Scotia? Does this help with that process? It is. Yes, it is a tool. With if the doctor chooses to incorporate themselves, this would be made available to them as well. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. Um, and now I'm going back to. Um, to something that uh, was said earlier about, about doctors in Nova Scotia and, and the shortage. We are, and I, I know we've had this conversation last week and I need to say it again because there's, there's been some misinformation again. Where, where are we in Canada uh, with all our other jurisdictions in the recruitment process of, of a plan? Like you came here specifically to Nova Scotia for a reason. Uh, Deputy Minister of Health, can you share that again so that people who might have missed it last week can hear it again this week. Ms. Parrott? Um, you're correct. Nova Scotia is uh, a very attractive place to come if you're interested in health care reform, uh, partly because there's an innovative collaborative spirit here. Uh, there's good discussions and we're seeing that, right? We have health care workers, frontline workers, professional groups contributing to that discussion. And, and the, the platform, the size, the progress made in this province really positions it well to move ahead. I think it is among the leaders in Canada for the type of shifts that need to be made in the system. An example is the proactive nature of physician recruitment. Uh, I think it is highly organized here, and I can't say for sure that no one else is at the same point, but I would, uh, I know that we are leading, among the leaders, I should say. Um, can you also uh, just give us a quick timeline uh, for the QE2 uh, for the infrastructure projects that are occurring there? Um, thank you for the question uh, because I wasn't able to answer Mr. Wilson when he asked. There is a timeline for the QET on a website. Um, so I'm happy to say that if you go to connectedcare.ca, uh, you can be, you can uh, watch the planning process from that perspective. Thank you. Order. Thank you very Thank you. much for everyone's questions and of course for all the answers from our witnesses. Um, Mr. Rafus? Yes, uh, earlier somebody asked for a copy of my opening remarks. I'd like to table a copy and, and have a copy for all the uh, committee members as well. Thank you very much, Mr. Rafus.
we do have some time left and I will allow um, both departments to provide some brief closing comments. Perhaps you can keep it to about two minutes if you can. Ms. Parrott. Thank you very much. Um, and I'll just respond to a question that I didn't answer earlier with respect to the capital plan. Um, I'm advised that we provided the committee with a list of projects that are on the capital plan last November, December. Uh, South Shore and Pugwash were both on that list, so there would be some information provided to the committee. And then I thank the committee for this opportunity to have the discussion. Um, I actually learned something from these discussions and I've now come to describe it as an unusual onboarding process, but one that I actually do appreciate uh, and, and, and thank you for the discussion. Thank you, Ms. Parrott. Uh, Mr. Rafuse. Uh, yes, so the committee, thank you very much for, ha uh, for having me here. Uh, and if you want to invite me back sometime to talk about internal controls over financial reporting, uh, which we never got to that topic, uh, we're certainly welcome to do that. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, we, uh, our next meeting is on uh, April 19th, and that is uh, to discuss regulatory review, and we will have the Office of Regulatory Affairs and Service Effectiveness with us. Um, prior to that meeting, we have a subcommittee meeting to select topics for future meetings, and that begins at 8.30 on April 19th. On April 26th, we do not have a meeting, but on May 3rd, we have a meeting on school capital planning, and that's on Chapter 2 of the November 2016th report of the Auditor General. The Auditor General has offered a briefing uh, prior to that meeting. Uh, we have a couple of options. As I mentioned, uh, our next meeting begins at 8.30, uh, and uh, would conclude at 11 o'clock. Uh, usually we do our briefings before the meetings, um, but that's not to say we couldn't add a briefing in on the 19th for the May 3rd meeting. The other option is to have the briefing on May 3rd, perhaps at 8.30, a half hour before the meeting starts. Uh, do members have a preference? I did see a couple of heads nod in favor of 8.30 a.m. on May 3rd. All those in agreement? I see agreement. Our clerk will make note of that. Is there any further business to come before the committee? Hearing none, this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>